The Lord be with you. Thank you so much for joining us in this Bible study as we look together at Romans chapter 13, verses 11 to 12. Paul has given the command to love, echoing the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ, that this is the distinguishing mark of God's people in the world, our love. Not for the people who deserve love, but for everyone. For everyone. But Paul doesn't stop there. He gives the reason for that command. Like a good teacher, he grounds the command in an understanding of time. He grounds it in a reason. He doesn't just wave the Bible. He doesn't just say, do this, do that, don't do that. He grounds it in a reason, and that reason is a right understanding of time, the moments that we're in. And so many of us are familiar with carpe diem, seize the day, and there's certainly a lot of wisdom in that. That comes from the Roman writer Horace, and so many people, many of us, live by that. We, we know life is short and we try to make the most out of every day, and we live like there's no tomorrow. But what we see in these verses is that we are not ready to seize the day until we realize, until we believe that there is one day on which every single other day will be judged. There is one day on which every single day, all of time, all of history will be judged. And that day is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what we need to know is that with every passing day, with every passing moment, history is drawing to its climax, to its conclusion. And that conclusion is the return of Jesus to finish what he began. That's what we need to see. It's closer and closer every second. So we read together verse 11. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. We need to understand the present time. And when Paul uses the word time, we need to know that Greek has two different words for time. There's chronos, which is chronology, time, the ticking clock. But there's also kairos. And kairos is the the word that Paul is using here. Kairos is a moment, a season that is pregnant with significance and meaning. We need to understand not just what day of the week it is or what day in the month it is or what year it is even. We need to know the season that we are in. And the Bible outlines history in two phases. There is the present age, an age, a time marked by rebellion against God, where we can see the fallenness of the world around us and we can see the fallenness within our own hearts and our own minds. That's this age. But there's also the age to come. And the New Testament shows us that with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ that we celebrate every Christmas, with his life, his death, and his resurrection and ascension to heaven, the age to come has broken into the present age. The the, the age, the time when God is redeeming his people, when God is bringing about righteousness across the globe when his kingdom is coming to earth, when his will is being done on earth as it is in heaven, that age has broken into the present age. And so in in our current moment, in this present time that Paul talks about, these these ages are overlapping. These ages are overlapping until that time when Jesus returns. Bodily and physically, the same Jesus 
who was born to the Virgin Mary, the same Jesus who walked the sands of the Sea of Galilee, the same Jesus who was crucified under Pontius Pilate, the same Jesus who was raised from the dead three days later, the same Jesus who ascended to heaven, that same Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, will come back to finish what he began. And that means we need to know the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. And in, in view of the present time, we need to know how to live. And so th there are a few different traps that we can fall into in misunderstanding this. The first is that many are simply oblivious to what time it is. They're simply oblivious. They're living like there is no age to come. They're living like we've got to make the most of any given time. They're living like they don't have to worry about a final judgment. They're living like there is no real conclusion to history. We can just wait for when maybe the sun blows up and that will be the end of, of everything. But many are just simply oblivious. And so what followers of the Lord Jesus Christ need to do is to call people to wake up, realize this present moment, realize this time with every passing moment. Two things are drawing closer and closer. One is your own death and my own death. Something we really don't want to think about. Something we want to postpone. Something that when we're younger, we think can't touch us. But with every passing moment, our death, our demise, our end, draws closer and closer and closer. And the return of Jesus draws closer and closer and closer. Do you realize that? That we're not living in a, in a random moment. History has meaning. History is moving toward a conclusion. Are you ready for it? Are you living like you're ready for it? Wake up if you're not. It's time to wake up from our slumber, from our sleepiness. We never know because Jesus made this very clear and Paul makes it very clear here. We're not given a timetable. We're not given a timeline. All we know is that between the ascension of Jesus and his return, we're not told that there's anything else on God's calendar, so to speak. That's it. So we cannot afford to be oblivious and we cannot afford to allow our loved ones and our neighbors to be oblivious. This is how we love them, by telling them the truth with as, with as, as much grace as we possibly can. We must tell them the truth. Jesus is coming back, and Jesus is the judge of every single one of us. I'm not the judge. You're not the judge. Jesus is. Why? Because Jesus lived the perfect life. He treated people as God wants people to be treated. He was faithful and righteous where we were unfaithful and unrighteous. He's done everything and said everything that we haven't. He's everything we are not. He is perfect in every way possible. Therefore, he has earned the right to be the judge. Your life will not be measured by your parents' standards or what your church says or what your pastor says or what your friends say about you. Your life will be judged by the standard of Jesus. Do you realize that? Are you humbled by that? Wake up. We can't afford to be oblivious. Neither can we afford to be careless. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Many Christians aren't oblivious to this truth. They do believe that Jesus will come back one day in God's perfect timing. They just don't seem to live like they believe it. They don't seem to pay much attention to it. They, they know it intellectually, but their hearts haven't been changed by that truth at all. They live like time will just keep going on and on and on. They live like they just need to seize this day or any given day and make the most of it without realizing that there is the day on which every other day will be judged. And so it's a form of carelessness. It's complacency, not looking to that salvation. And what we need to wake up to and be alert to is that salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Salvation, the completion of our salvation. So we need to understand 
three distinct phases of salvation. The first, when we say we've been saved, what we mean is we've been justified, something that Paul has hammered home throughout this letter. And our justification, our, our righteous standing before God, is wholly and entirely on the basis of what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus paid the penalty with his very own righteous life. He didn't have to do that. He did it willingly and out of love, not for good people, but for sinners. So the penalty for sins has been paid for everyone who puts their trust in him and who rests in his finished work. We are justified when when we stand before the tribunal of Christ in his judgment seat and God looks upon us. He doesn't see our filthy rags of unrighteousness. He sees the righteousness of Christ transferred to us, credited to us. That's justification. But there's also a sense in which we are being saved. Because even though we have been saved, even though our sins have been paid for on the cross, you and I both know we're still sinners, or at least we should know. We still have thoughts and attitudes, and we still do things, and we still fail to do things that are sinful and that are ugly and that are abhorrent to our holy and righteous God. And so God has filled us with the Holy Spirit to sanctify us, to cleanse us from the inside out. This is what we call sanctification. This is being saved. This is being conformed and transformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's where salvation is aimed, is to shape you and mold you into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ so that you live more like him and so that you speak more like him. But what Paul's talking about here is the final stage of salvation our total complete salvation, which we call glorification, when we reflect the perfect glory of the risen Christ, when he was raised from the dead, when he came out of the tomb. It was still him, but as you'll recall, the disciples sometimes had a hard time recognizing that it was him. There's something different, but when their eyes are open, they realize it's Jesus, the same Jesus with whom we fished, the same Jesus we saw heal, The same Jesus who calmed the waves of the storm. That same Jesus, but there's something different. He's been glorified. He's been transformed so that the body he has now can never die. It can never be corrupted. It can never rot or be eaten by worms as our bodies will be if they're buried. And that's what awaits for us, for our total salvation. So that not only has the penalty for our sins been paid, Not only has the power of sin been broken by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, but the very presence of sin has been eradicated forever so that we can experience a new heaven and a new earth where there are no more tears, there's no more disease, there's no more sickness. All is as it should be. God's kingdom infiltrating this world, permeating this world. That's what we long for. That's the salvation that that Jesus brings with him. That's the salvation that is nearer now than when we first believe, when we were first justified. Wake up, be alert. It's closer and closer and closer, our total salvation. We can't afford to be careless. We don't know how many more Sundays God will give us. I don't know how many more Bible studies or sermons the Lord will allow me to preach or to teach. And so, I'm going to do, as another old pastor named Richard Baxter said, I'm going to preach like a dying man to dying men. I'm going to give every single message like it's my very last one because it may very well be, and I want to make it count. I want to say everything I need to say as plainly and as clearly as I can. I want you to know that this isn't about me. This is about Jesus. He is our Savior. Do you know him? Have you trusted in him? Are you resting in his work on the cross for you? Do you believe that he can give you eternal life? Do you believe that one day you will have to stand before him as your judge? That day is drawing closer and closer. We can't afford to be careless. We can't afford to be complacent. We must face it head on and prepare our hearts because it could be any moment. But neither can we afford to be restless or anxious, or worried, because 
the day is almost here. The night is nearly over. And for those who put their trust in Christ, this is a joyous, glorious day, something we look forward to. But this anxiety shows up in in a couple different forms. One is when we act like we can all we can we can plot it all out with with charts or timetables and and we try to pinpoint exactly what god is doing through various world events and we say oh this must be it and history sadly is littered with attempts by misguided christians and misguided pastors to try to pinpoint the exact time jesus said he didn't know when he was alive on this earth but somehow pastors now can think that they do And so you'll see, well, the end of time is going to be in 1988. Well, clearly that didn't happen. And so on and so forth. People are trying to make predictions that they can't. But it reveals this restlessness, this this anxiety and, 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 and worry that we've got to get it just right. No, we don't. Trust God. It's in his hands. That day will come, and it will come like a thief in the night. No one can fully predict it. All we know is that we need to be ready for it. But it shows up in another way, too. When Christians, Christians now, people who believe in what Jesus has done for them, people who confess Jesus as Lord of their lives, people who believe in heaven, think and act as though they love this life more than the life to come. And, and it doesn't really make sense, but you know that. And we think, well, nothing could be better than the time I'm spending with my spouse or with my kids. And I... I I enjoy this life. Well, that's good. That's good. God wants you to glorify him in each and every day that he gives you. He wants you to be a good steward of the time that he gives you with your family. He wants you to enjoy him as you enjoy your family because these are all good gifts from him. But realize there is an age to come. Heaven is real and heaven is better than anything in this world. Do you really believe that? And the more you believe that, the more you will actually enjoy this life because then you won't think that this meal or this moment with your spouse or with your kids is heaven. You won't be looking for heaven on earth because you know you won't find it. So you will enjoy this meal for what it is. You will enjoy this moment for what it is. It's not heaven, but it's a gift from God. And the more you are convinced that the heaven, the new heaven and the new earth, where there are no more tears, where all is as it should be, the more you are convinced that that's real and that that's coming and that's a joyous day because of what Jesus has done for you, the more you're going to enjoy life in this world, as short and as uncertain as it is. So don't be anxious about it. We don't have to fear death. We don't have to be restless about it. We don't look forward to dying any more than the non-Christian or anyone else but we don't fear it because of what Jesus has done for us and because of what he's promised for us. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. We'll talk more next week about what that looks like to clothe ourselves with this armor and to put aside the deeds of darkness. But for now, I need to ask you, do you know what time it is? Do you know who is Lord of all time? And are you ready for his return? Because when he returns, there will be a final judgment. And some will be consigned to eternal separation from the Lord of life. And it will be sad and tragic and yet just because God is just. And no one can say, God, you didn't give me a chance. God, this isn't fair because we're all in bondage to our sin. And some will hear those blessed words, well done, good and faithful servant. Come enjoy my presence and my rest forever. Not because of anything you've done, not because you've earned it, not because you deserve it, but all because of my generosity, my mercy, and my amazing grace for sinners, for a wretch like me. Are you ready for that day? Do you look forward to that day? Do you believe with all your heart that Jesus is not only your judge, but he's your Lord and he is your savior? I want to end with a saying my, my grandmother used to, to use. It comes from a, a missionary to China named Charles Studd. And it goes like this. Only one life to live. It will soon be passed. 
only what is done for Christ will last? Are you living and doing things that will last? Are you living for Christ now or not? I pray that you would by the power of the Holy Spirit and by his grace as we go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, wake us up. We confess that on our own, we tend to either be oblivious or careless or, or restless. We confess that we lose sight of where we are, that the age to come, the new age, eternal life has broken into this world. And we confess that so often we long for and, and love this present life more than we look forward to the age to come. Lord, wake us up out of our slumber. Show us the glory of Christ, the beauty of his character, the depth of his love. Show us his excellencies. Show us the riches of heaven and create in us a desire to know that, to look forward to that. Forgive us for when we reduce heaven to playing a harp and clouds in the sky. Help us to be convinced that heaven, the new heaven and the new earth is something we want, that we crave, that we long for, that we thirst for and hunger for, where there are no more tears, there is no more cancer, there's no more death. All the things that hurt and sting in this life are obliterated by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, may he be our Lord and our Savior. May we trust him when we trust in what he has done for us may we be convinced that we need to prepare now we can't take any moment for granted we can't take any opportunity for granted he could return any moment lord help us to be ready for we pray these things in jesus name amen so glad you could join us if you haven't already be sure to subscribe on youtube like and follow us on facebook and email me if you have any questions or, or prayer concerns or ministry needs. Have a wonderful week.